Well, over a million, hundred million people will gather around their television monitors uh, tonight to tune into the, I think it's the 51st uh, Super Bowl, uh, with the average 30-second uh, commercial spot costing anywhere between five and five and a half uh, million dollars. Now, in comparison, a 30-second commercial spot for the seventh game of a rather historic World Series costs only, I should say, I shouldn't say only, 500,000 dollars. Interestingly enough, almost 20% of the viewers uh, tonight will look forward more to the commercials than the game. But in all the attention and all the festivities uh, surrounding the game, I'm reminded of the good spirit that it creates uh, not only for America, but also uh, for the world. And even though many of our uh, favorite teams don't end up in the annual showcase, I believe we are left with a positive impression of how much the game actually brings the world together, uh, at least for a night. And some of the media coverage of the game usually sheds light on the characters and the backgrounds of some of the players, of which we may have never known about unless those reports came forward. One of the articles featured a private Quaker school named William Penn Charter, uh, in the Philadelphia area, where Atlanta quarterback uh, Matt Ryan went to school before he went to college and then on, and then on to the NFL. I say this because of the standard of conduct that the school encourages and the peacefulness in which the Quaker religion was founded back in the 17th century uh, England when they broke off from the Church of England. Heavily persecuted in England, and in early America, the Quaker denomination has also emphasized the importance of a personal connection to God and that no one individual is bigger than the community. The article reported that the school's chief tenet of peace is not antithetical to heated competition. There is nothing wrong with striving to achieve if it's kept in perspective. The chief administrator of the Quaker Charter School said that competition itself is not a problem, but if competition interferes with one's relationship with the divine, then it is a problem. With this, I'm reminded of the 18th and 19th century German statesman and writer uh, Johann Goethe when he said, civilization is a permanent exercise in respect, respect for the divine, respect for the earth, respect for our fellow man, and respect for our own dignity. Now, I think of all these things when I think of what seems to be, and we heard two different stories today read by Shelley, the, the story of the man raised from the dead and, and the first story of the centurion. But I'm thinking of these things that we just talked about when I, when I consider the, what I think to be one of Jesus' favorite characters in the New Testament, and that is the Roman centurion that we heard about in Luke 7. The reading this morning by Shelley leads, leaves the reader with a, favorably, a very favorable impression of an unnamed Roman leader who is concerned enough about the failing health of his servant that he seeks out the Jewish elders with the expectation that they can convince Jesus to meet with the centurion and his servant with the hope that Jesus will save the man from his perilous health. Now, the first good impression about the centurion comes in verse 5 when the elders tell Jesus that this Roman soldier has great respect for the Jewish nation, so much that he ordered the building of a synagogue for the Jewish people of that community. Now, something he did not surely have to do, but in his generosity, and in his sensitivity to the traditions of others, he saw the need and he responded to it. His generous and very noble act of generosity. The second good impression of the centurion comes in the form of humility. As Jesus draws closer to the centurion's home, and out of respect for the messianic character of Jesus, the centurion sent, out, sent some of his troops out to meet Jesus, for he thought himself that he was not worthy for Jesus to come under his roof. And for this reason, he said, 
I do not consider myself worthy to come to you. The soldier himself knew that he himself had great authority, but he leaves the reader with the feeling that he has put his own authority into its proper perspective, and he sees Jesus as the one with ultimate authority. Humility, it seems, was one of the centurion's greatest assets and greatest virtues. The next good impression of the centurion that we have is compassion and empathy. Enough that he has made the effort to seek out Jesus to heal his servant. He cares enough about his servant that he has gone to great lengths to restore his health. And finally, Luke leaves you with the impression that the centurion is a man of great faith. Not too often in all the scriptures does Jesus offer praise about one's level of faith. He certainly does hear about the centurion. He said, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. So here we have a Gentile or a non-Jew who views Christ through clearer eyes than even the people of Christ's own faith tradition uh, see him and view him. Here you have a man who was characterized by humility in spite of his position of authority in the most powerful military machine at that time. And here you have a man who has tremendous devotion and compassion toward his servant. Now, when we consider role models in the Bible, the ones that naturally come to mind are the likes of an Abraham, you know, the father of Israel who leads the people out on their journey to become a nation. Or Moses, the one, of course, who dramatically leads the deliverance of Israel from the oppression of the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Or a David who refuses to back down from Goliath and becomes one of Israel's greatest warriors. Or a disciple, Peter, in the New Testament, who redeems himself from the betrayal of, of Jesus and becomes one of the great promoters of Jesus in the post-resurrection period. Or as a result of the Apostle Paul's crucible along that dusty road to Damascus, he certainly stands out as a Christian role model in his successful missionary journeys to spread Christianity. But on a role model scale of 1 to 10, the Soterian would be lucky to register 2, maybe even 1, in a popular vote because he has no name identification. Although there are other centurions in the New Testament, this particular one is only mentioned once, and therefore certainly isn't a household name like a Moses or a David or a Paul or a Peter. But nevertheless, when you think about it, the virtues of this man, wouldn't you want your children to grow up with the character of this unnamed centurion? He was a man with goals. He was a man of ambition. He was a man of faith. He was a man who worked hard. He was a man of compassion. He was a my, my, man of open-mindedness. And he was a man that embraced those different from him. The 17th Spanish Jesuit, Jesuit Balthazar Gratian, said, Unprejudiced thinking has always been the breeding ground of wisdom. It would seem that the generous and noble character of the Roman centurion could teach us a lot about judicious and unprejudiced thinking, along with all his other redoubtable virtues, one of which was grace. You know, there are some good Presbyterian parallels when one considers uh, the generosity and nobility of the Roman centurion. The first American to orbit the earth and a former U.S. Senator, uh, John Glenn, died last December. And in a tribute to him, the New York Times in its obituary wrote that he was a good-natured man. He was well-grounded. He was a Midwesterner. He was nurtured in patriotism. He was tested in war. He stepped forward to risk the unknown lifting his country's morale and restoring its self-confidence. It also said that he was raised in Presbyterian rectitude, which basically means our denomination's historic emphasis on high moral behavior, humility, high-mindedness, 
at which John Glenn seemed to have all three, particularly evidence in his reluctance to talk about himself as an American hero. He said, I figure I'm the same person who grew up in New Concord, Ohio, and went off through the years to participate in a lot of events of, of importance. All of this would have happened to anyone, anyone who would have been selected for that flight. The level of rectitude is significant, you see, with its generosity and nobility, similar to the style and the substance of the centurion. Another thing about the centurion is that he appears to have a high confidence in himself, enough to go out onto the limb and to attest to his admiration and his respect for Christ. He seems secure in his own self-appraisal, which often means that deep within is the faith in the gift of grace. Even though the centurion felt significant pressure to achieve and excel, and the expectations for performance were very high, there still seems to be a serenity and a grace to his temperament, considering his favorable outlook on those different from him and his responsibility for those dependent on him. Now, although many of his peers and his contemporaries failed to recognize the divine character of, of Christ, this man, this didn't stop the centurion from recognizing the great gift of God in the form of the Messiah. The unnamed centurion was grace-filled, accepting the fact that you are accepted by God, no matter from which country you come, from which nationality you derive, from which social economic status you find yourself, from which issue you are struggling with, from which rejection you are feeling, you are still loved. You are still welcomed. You are still wanted by God. 20th century American theologian Paul Tillich said, when grace takes hold, everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement. And nothing is demanded of this experience, no religious or moral or intellectual presupposition. Nothing but acceptance. Grace was an important building block in the character of the centurion. The centurion teaches, a lot, teaches us a lot today in a world where the values of the centurion may have been diminished. David Brooks writes in his book, Road to Character, which I have quoted before, that when Google scans the contents of, of books and publications going back decades, it picks up a sharp rise in the usage of, usage of individualistic words and phrases like self and personalized or I come first or I can do it myself. And a sharp decline in words as community and share and united and common good. Usage of words like character and conscience and virtue have all declined. Usage of the word bravery, for instance, has declined by 66%. Or gratitude is down 49%. Humbleness is down 52%. Kindness is down 56%. What does all this say? There could easily be a rise in values that run contrary to the values of the centurion. Remember those again. He was generous. He was noble in his outreach to others. Although his faith tradition didn't, inc didn't include any expectation for the Messiah, he was humble in his reticence to have Jesus under his own roof. He was empathetic and he was compassionate toward his servant friend. And he was a man of extraordinary faith. And finally, he was a man who received God's grace. You know, it's all we can do as families in teaching our young people these virtues. It's all we can do as a church family in teaching ourselves 
these values. It's all we can do as individuals to discover the generosity and the nobility of the character of the centurion and the grace of a person whose values serve as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen.